Good morning. I am uh, doing a first for me as a pastor, and uh, it may be the last. If you don't like it, we'll see. Uh, but we are about to start on a book study of the letter of Romans. Uh, I put the text that I'm going to be using for the next three Sundays in last week's connection and invited you to read the book of Romans and especially those texts and uh, tell me your comments about that. And uh, I know at least one person has done that and uh, those comments were very helpful. So I appreciate that and I'm excited about uh, studying this book together with you. Since we're going to be in Romans for a little while, I thought a little context might be helpful. Uh, this is something that uh, might seem obvious to you, but it took a little while to sink in for me, so I thought we'd just review a little bit. It is easy to assume that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, since they are the first books in the New Testament, and since they are the ones that tell the story of Jesus, that those are the earliest materials in the New Testament. This is not the case. The Gospels, the earliest biblical material that we have are the letters of Paul. <clears throat> the earliest biblical writings were Paul's letters to Jewish and non-Jewish believers in Jesus Christ. These folks probably wouldn't have used the word Christian to describe themselves because that word really didn't exist yet. They didn't think of themselves as the church. They were just a group of believers who met for prayer and meals in one another's homes and to support each other. They were followers of Christ or followers of the way. Paul's letters were written between the years 50 and 68 AD. At the beginning of Paul's ministry in the 30s, not the 1930, the 30s, there would have been many believers who knew the story of Jesus because they had seen it themselves. They were eyewitnesses to the events of Jesus' life. The first gospel, the earliest gospel, the Gospel of Mark, was written in the late 60s, about the time that Paul was finishing up writing all of his letters. The author of Mark was a generation removed from the physical life and ministry of Jesus. The Gospels were written so that that story would not be forgotten as the people who had actually witnessed it were beginning to pass away. Paul met the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus and had a dramatic conversion. He began as the Pharisee persecutor of followers of Jesus Christ, and he became the foremost church planter and theologian of the Jesus movement. Before the gospel stories of Jesus' life and ministry were written for the new church, Paul's letters were the church's instruction and inspiration. That makes these letters incredibly informative as a record of what the new church was wrestling with, what informed later thought and practice, and what should be important for us. Paul was both a theologian and a church planter. This is important because he wasn't just doing theology in his head and writing about the law and grace and sin and justification. He was actually out with people and seeing the way they behaved and fought and behaved badly. And I'm here to tell you that people have not changed that much in the last 2,000 years. The first 11 chapters of Romans are written by Paul the theologian. And they have a lot of material in there about our faith and what it is that we believe about God and what it is that we know about ourselves. The next four chapters are much more about ethics. Those come from Paul, the church planter. They're instruction about how we ought to treat one another. And the order of these two things is important because our ethics 
is rooted in our faith. In other words, if I believe this about God and Jesus Christ, then I ought to behave in this way towards other people. I've chosen to begin at the end of the theology section, the end of chapter 11, because I think it talks about what is foundational about our faith. And I'd like to hear if you agree. Maybe not right this minute, but later, certainly. Here is what Paul says about God. God alone is God, and God is good. Paul acknowledges in verse 25 that this is a mystery, even to him, who is the major theologian of the early church. The depth and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God are beyond our understanding. God is worthy of praise because God works for good in ways that we don't understand. And God works for good not only for us, but for other people, too. And one of the things that we find it hard to understand about God is how God could love those other people. Philip Yancey, who wrote the book, What's So Amazing About Grace, tells a story about a conversation that he had with a friend of his, a young man who had been very involved in the church when he was young. He hadn't been back to the church for many years. This young man was a recovering alcoholic, and he told Philip that AA, or Alcoholics Anonymous, was his church. And Philip asked him, what is it that alcoholics understand that the church hasn't figured out yet? And this young man thought for a time, and then he said quietly, dependency. See, anyone who is addicted to alcohol or another substance understands what it is to be slave to a chemical substance. But anybody who is in recovery has figured out something that the church often struggles with, which is we do not have the power to save ourselves. We need a power beyond ourselves to break the enslavement of sin and addiction and our own bad behavior. We cannot do that ourselves. Praise is something which Christians ought to agree on. We praise God because from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. In another tradition, somebody would have said amen to that. We cannot say this too often or too sincerely. It ought to be something that we can proclaim with one voice. But there is a flip side of praise that can trip us up if we're not careful. And this is what Paul is talking about in chapters 12 through 15. The flip side of praise is humility. If we agree that there is one God, and God alone is worthy of praise, then, darn it all, I'm not God. I am not the one who has unsearchable wisdom and knowledge. I am, in fact, like everybody else, because none of you is God either. Through the depth of God's riches, we have all been given gifts. Gifts we can use together as members of the body of Christ. But those gifts are to be used to build up the entire body, not so that one person can boast that they have more wisdom than anyone else. When I am at a secure place, personally and spiritually, praise and humility are a win-win. It is wonderful to be able to praise God with abandon, and it is freeing to acknowledge that I am not God, 
Because let me tell you, being God is hard work. I have tried it. I am terrible at it. Trying to make everybody happy, trying to address every criticism, trying to get everything done myself, I cannot do that. And I cannot truly praise God if I am secretly trying to do God's job. Believe me, it can be difficult to make yourself fully available for praise, especially if you're somebody who is regularly involved in worship planning. The other part I need to let go of is the sense that everything depends on me. It doesn't. Whether or not I choose to praise God, God is still God and worthy of praise. The character and the generosity of God should compel me to offer praise, but God's worthiness does not depend on me or anyone else. I don't offer God praise to get something in return, a handshake, a star in my crown, whatever. I praise God because God is God. And thank God, I am not God. Praise puts us first in correct alignment with God, and then in correct alignment with ourselves, and finally in correct alignment with other people. If we have a healthy perspective about ourselves and the ways we have messed things up and our limitations, then we ought to be able to extend some grace when other people mess up or are limited. This doesn't mean that we don't try our best at our work and the work of the church, and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about how we can do things better. What it means is that we begin with the understanding that each one of us has messed up. And just because I messed up in a different way than you did doesn't make me a better person than you. Neither of us has to carry the burden of being God. We should encourage each other a lot because we're still trying to figure it out. Praise God that God is smarter than we are because we get it wrong sometimes. As long as we can remember that God is God, and we are not, we can get back on track and move forward. But if we steamroll the engine over anybody in our path, or if we retreat to the emotional caboose and shut everybody else out, we have derailed the train of ministry, and we're not going to get anywhere. Praise God for the gift of Jesus Christ who came so that our sin and our shortcomings do not have to define our relationship with God and with each other. Praise God that God understands things that we do not. Praise God that we don't have to save ourselves from our sin. To God be the glory forever. Amen.